All right, we're gonna kick this program off. This is really cool. As I mentioned yesterday, we've been doing more case studies in the program this year because so many of you ask for it. And what's cool is last year, we got to hear about the beginning of KeyBank's journey in introducing DevOps culture and practices to their organization. And really what they were talking about was how they're going to start that journey. And today, we have how that has been applied, or at least begun to be applied, in the organization as a whole. And Chris McPhee is actually who talked about it with uh, one of his colleagues last year, too. So it's not some other person making up a different story. It's the evolution of how they've been doing this stuff in their organization right now. Chris is a technology leader at KeyBank who is directly responsible for continuous integration and continuous delivery in the organization. Big hand for Chris. Thank you. Uh, so so just, just real quickly, I want to thank, make sure that uh, I thank that all the event staff here, uh, Warner, Bill, uh, Andy, et cetera. Um, why don't we all give them a, a big round of applause as well. Uh, so I know yesterday it was asked, how many of it, how many is, is this your first DevOps Days Ohio? Okay, awesome. Um, so so we, did, we did come up here last year and talk about our journey, so I'll, I'll go uh, hit the highlights uh, o, o, of what we've been able to accomplish over the last couple of years. Um, hopefully you've got your uh, buzzword bingo card ready. Um, it's, it's full of the, the buzzword bingo. Um, and... and I, I would be remiss if I didn't have one reference to Conway's Law, so uh, one of my coworkers uh, put it, Conway's Law Law. Every time you come to a DevOps conference, there's, there's always a mention of Conway's Law, so. Um, so the presentation is uh, the DevOps abides. It really brings the organization together. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that you, you get the reference um, to, to the big Lebowski there. Uh, my name is Chris McPhee. I've been at KeyBank for more than 12 years now. I've, I've held a, a number of different roles there. Uh, I've got a background in system administration, uh, enterprise architecture. Um, so who is KeyBank? Um, we're a bank that's based out of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, we've, we've been um, growing responsibly since uh, 1825 through um, acquisition. Um, we've, got, we're, we're, we've, we've got a footprint in 15 different states, um, a lot in the upper northwest, so uh, the Washington state area, Alaska, um, and then obviously Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, and New York. Um, so one of the things that we started out with um, back in, in 2015 um, is, is we were having some issues with our, our online channel. Um, so one of the things that was asked of us to, to do a deep dive and understand how complex our online banking platform actually is. Um, so we would have outages and we wouldn't know where to look. Um, so so they, they really got a bunch of us together and, and asked us to do the deep dive. And what we came up with is we're a really complex bank, especially growing through acquisition, a lot of technical debt. Um, this is just a, a, a picture, uh, and I'm not sure how, how great the resolution is, but um, of all the different infrastructure pieces that are involved in our online banking solution. Um, and then what we did is we actually determined what, an, what the transactional flow is of somebody logging into online banking. So last year we put this up here with a bunch of lines. Um, this year we thought we'd show the, the actual animation. So the animation that I'm going to show here in, in, a, in a few seconds, um, it really depicts uh, a user coming in uh, to our online banking application. Um, it would be one user coming into um, one of our data centers, simultaneously another user coming in to the other data center. They click login on their login box on online banking, and this is what transpires. Maybe. Maybe not. There it goes. So you see the, the lines start to fill in. About 180 different transactions through the different pieces of infrastructure later, the user gets their, their accounts page. Um, 
Uh, again, I can't really tell how well it translates up on the, on the screen there, but there's a, there's a bunch of red lines, there's a bunch of green lines. Uh, the red lines is one data center, the green lines is another data center. Those purple lines are actually um, us going through round robin across both data centers. Um, so we, we have a highly, a highly available environment, and one of the things that we wanted to do is run hot, hot. Well, we actually found out through this, uh, this exercise that we're not as highly available as we think we are. You'll see a lot of those red lines going down to the other data center and not going back up. You'll see a lot of the green lines going up, and then, like I said, the, the purple lines where you have the opportunity to go between two data centers. Now that really poses a problem uh, if you're trying to isolate traffic if there is a problem. So uh, in the event, um, you'll see a lot of, a lot of lines there, um, the red lines and the green lines focused in on um, one area. That, that's actually a piece of uh, network infrastructure. It's one of our firewalls. Um, so in the event that one of those goes down, we have real issues. One of those actually had gone down. We had real issues. Um, so, so that really got us into, well, how can we how can we really make this better a better experience for our customers? Um, we we put some put some things in place, made some recommendations, got some things implemented. Um, as a part of that, one of the recommendations that we said is let's really try this DevOps stuff and let's see let's see what happens. So that kind of goes into managing our technical debt. So. In our organization, we have really three big stakeholders. We've got our development areas, we've got our security and enterprise architecture area, and then we have our operations area. Developments really focus on getting solutions out there for our retail customers, our treasury customers, our corporate real estate, HR and finance. Security, obviously, is, is their, their paramount of in, in an age of hacking and, and when things get um, get broken into, making sure that all the controls are in place, making sure that we're following standards, making sure that we're not vulnerable. And then we have operations, so our operations area around um, the different infrastructure pieces, so platforms like databases, our operating systems, Unix, Windows, network area, storage. And what, what, what we see and, and what we've seen across a lot of different organizations as we've talked to them is they're really opposing forces, right? Um, so development wants to get things out there as fast as they can for their, their line of business partners, security's adding more security all the time, and the operations team is just trying to make sure that nothing, nothing goes down and everything stays up. So you really have that opposing forces um, as, as a part of talking to all of those, those groups together. So what, what we did is um, we, we started talking to different organizations. Um, we went out to DevOps Enterprise Summit out in San Francisco, um, and we read a lot of books. Um, so Phoenix Project, um, how many people? Phoenix Project, awesome. Uh, DevOps Handbook was, was, came shortly thereafter. Uh, the Continuous Delivery book um, from Jez Humble and, uh, and, and, and group. Um, how Google does testing um, was really good. And then because of our relationships uh, with, with some of our different partners uh, and, and vendors, we were able to get, uh, get in contact with, uh, with thought leaders like John Willis, um, who was really able to help us um, come up with a cohesive strategy on what we needed to do in order to kind of jumpstart um, jump our process. The other thing that we really uh, took, a, took a liking to as, as we were doing all of our research um, was uh, Matthew Skelton, who talked about the different patterns of DevOps and anti-patterns of DevOps. So we wanted to put a pattern in place um, to make sure that we were successful in, in what we were trying to do. So we really wanted to partner ourselves with our online banking um, platform. They were going through a re-platform um, making a single page architecture application based on um, uh, JavaScript, um, doing RESTful services, um, and, and there was really a big push to get a, a, new, uh, a, a new face of our online banking application out there. Um, so that was scheduled to be delivered in 2017, um, and then um, we announced that we were acquiring a bank out of, out of uh, New York, uh, First Niagara. Um, so they were actually going to cancel that entire project because they didn't want our customers to convert um, to the new platform. Our customers, uh, or I'm sorry, they didn't want our First Niagara customers to convert to our online banking platform and then have to convert again to another online banking platform. And that's really when we stepped in and we said, hey, we can help facilitate getting you guys um, 
out there faster on budget. Um, so it was actually scheduled to be delivered in 2017, and through the efforts of, of our team, we actually got them delivered in 2016, which was a great win for us. But um, how did we do that? We really, we really took a team of, of uh, six individuals. We focused them. Um, we called it the pilot DevOps team. Um, and we really treated it as DevOps as a service. So um, that is one of the patterns that Matthew Skelton said could be um, a, a way forward in, in, in your DevOps transformation. So what we did um, through the course of uh, a, about three months, we stood up a brand new compute platform uh, leveraging containers um, and Kubernetes. Um, we put self-service in place so that the, our development teams could really build their own delivery pipelines and continuous integration pipelines. We assisted them with um, automated testing. Um, so this is, this is kind of what our SDLC looked like. Um, so across the top, you can kind of see our SDLC st steps. Um, and as we got started, we really focused on really three key areas uh, to begin with. It was containers, it was automated testing, and it was continuous delivery. Um, so we, we, we affectionately say that we cheated um, as far as delivering infrastructure and delivering compute platforms um, with containers. Um, previously, um, it, it would take us months to get a server stood up. Um, we, if you look at uh, our presentation from last year that we did here, um, my coworker, John Rez, actually put together something he called Container Geddon. Um, so it was really about as we were delivering um, virtual machines or as we were delivering physical hardware, you first have to rack, rack the servers, you have to install um, your, your host uh, VM uh, hypervisor, then you had to install the guest OS on top of it, then you had to layer on the different platforms that you were going to install, then you had to install your, your different frameworks, your different applications, then you had to patch it, make sure that everything was up to date, make sure that everything was operationalized, making sure that there were no vulnerabilities. Um, and, and it ended up being about three months later, you would get a server in place that you could finally operationalize and, and put into production. We were also a very heavily siloed organization. So as you're thinking about you know, racking a server, that's one team. As you're thinking about installing the hypervisor, that's one team. As you're thinking about you know, the guest OS, that's another separate team. Onward and onward and so forth. So um, it, a couple dozen teams to, to get a server out the door um, was, was normal for us. Containers really solve that for us because you build it once uh, and no longer do you have to keep rebuilding it or repatching it. It's all atomic. You can rip and replace. So that was a great win for us. The other thing that we focused heavily on was um, automated testing. So we knew that if we wanted to be able to deliver faster, we had to make sure that there were tests in place to ensure quality was up and that it was all automated. Um, so I've got a slide in here um, in, in the next couple slides that talks about our automated testing uh, results. We took a very metrics-driven approach. We wanted to make sure that we were making things better, not worse. So on ev any, any given build, anytime somebody checks something into source code, it would kick off the build. It would run through the, the plethora of tests that would include unit tests, that would include some end-to-end -end regression tests. Um, so every single time somebody committed code, we were running about... Uh, seven to 8,000 different tests, uh, all in an automated fashion, um, and, and in under, I think it was about 15 minutes. I, I think the average was about 12 or 13 minutes on every single build. Um, so our developers were getting immediate feedback on um, as they were building their software. Uh, and then continuous delivery. So because we were using containers, because we, were, we had our continuous uh, integration in, in place at that point, now we could continuously put the application out somewhere so that we could do the manual smoke testing. We could make sure that um, things were being done from that perspective and we were continuously delivering um, the application in some sort of environment so that we could, we could get value on the testing in the, in the line of business. Finally, and, and we, we're, this is still a journey for us, um, and, and this is more of the, the second part of our story, is we started looking at agile practices. Um, and, and what's kind of humorous, I think, um, is we were a bunch of um, infrastructure technology folks, and we were the ones that were pushing agile practices for our development teams. We were a traditional waterfall. Um, so um, as, as we were going through our delivery process, um, we were really trying to get them to get smaller batches, really think about features, um, and, and as soon as things were ready, getting it out into production or a production-like environment so that it could be validated. 
everybody likes a good tooling slide, um, and, and usually this is when we see a bunch of people with, with cameras taking pictures of the slide, but um, it, it really, if, if you kind of look at the, um, the, the, from left to right, the SDLC sort of, um, you really start talking about design, taking in um, requirements, taking in features. You really talk about our builds, so using Git and Subversion. We were using some really old source, co source control um, software previously, so we, we started to um, put in um, new software. Um, we started using uh, artifact repositories instead of uh, artifact repositories instead of just placing it out in the source code, source control repository. Um, and then, like I said, a lot of those tools are really around our, our automated testing suite. Uh, kind of the, those yellow boxes are really what my team was focused on and, and continues to focus on. So um, continuous integration with Jenkins, um, continuous delivery. Uh, we use a tool from Exhibia Labs currently. Um, and then autom automation from a configuration management perspective. We got Chef, we've got Puppet, we've got Ansible. Um, those aren't currently on the slide. but uh, And then from a container perspective, uh, Docker and Kubernetes. So this really talks about our test automation, where we, at, where we were at before and where we're at now. Um, so from a testing perspective, it would take us days to manually test everything. Like I said, we put automated testing in place and now we were getting uh, 7,000 different automated tests running on, on every single build. <clears throat> The legacy uh, testing um, also made kind of the paradigm switch um, with our offshore testing team. Now they were able to focus more on, on getting more automated tests out there as opposed to manually testing things. So we were um, really being more consistent as it, as it pertained to our quality and getting things out the door. Then came our customer day one, uh, which is what we called when we onboarded our uh, first Niagara customers onto our platform. Um, so this was the heaviest time that we've, uh, we've seen from a, from a sign-in perspective. We were getting uh, approximately 30 logins a second or so. Um, there were some issues, though, with kind of our login flow and how, we were, how, how our customers were seeing the, the login flow. Um, there wasn't actually anything wrong with the, the technology itself, but um, kind of the, the requirements and workflow uh, for the login process wasn't as clear as it could have been. Um, so what we were able to do, um, because we had all of the automated tests in place, um, because we had the infrastructure and the automation in place, we were actually able to do 10 production releases in the middle of the day in that first week to help our customers um, better utilize our platform, um, which, was, which was pretty cool. We'd have somebody uh, in, a big in a big team room with all the executives, they'd push the button and they'd just kind of watch it slowly roll through. Um, and, and then the best piece about all of that, we were making these changes in production and we didn't cause any outages. There was no negative customer impact as a part of all of that, which was great. So like I mentioned earlier, we're almost a 200 year old bank. Um, and and this, is a, this is a great quote that we, we got from our CIO. Uh, DevOps has been a real catalyst for those of us, or for us and clearly one of those leading edge places that's helping build, helping our digital IQ. Um, so what this really spawned is, you know, we were, we were a pilot project um, focused on one thing. We had six individuals focused on one thing. Um, and then we had a, a reorg uh, that happened in May. And as a part of that reorg, our practices, the things that we were doing really came to the forefront. Um, and that talks about day two. Day two is hard. <laughs> Uh, so, so as you're scaling the practice, um, it, we had 700 plus applications at the bank. Um, previously, we were working on one. Um, we, at any given time, we've got more than 100 different projects in the pipeline that span um, three completely different um, portfolios um, that we have. So we have um, our, our consumer bank or our community bank, we have our corporate bank, and then we have all of the other um, enterprise business functions, things like HR, finance, et cetera. Um, so again, we were working on one project before and now there's 100 different projects in the pipeline and everybody wants to get on board with these practices so that they can get value out to the, their lines of business and their customers faster. 
Um, the other thing that we did uh, as a part of the reorg is we really brought, um, my team is really a team, um, a, a, a smaller team in a, in a, in a group of uh, three teams total. Um, we're, we're really focused on a lot of the continuous de integration and continuous development, but we also have um, change management and we also have our monitoring and alerting teams. Um, so as a part of the reorg, we really sat down and we value streamed out how the work flows through our organization and what that looks like as a part of the reorg. Um, really able to help try and identify some of the bottlenecks and how we were delivering things going forward, which, which helped a little bit as well. Um, so in, in addition to all of that, we started focusing on a lot of the agile practices, uh, getting a lot of our development and delivery teams up to speed on what it means to be agile in our enterprise. Um, so prior to us coming in with our, our one project um, that we helped started going a little bit faster, uh, it was bringing other, other teams up to speed kind of on those practices as well. So um, I think right now, um, I think we have four, four or five different teams now using agile practices um, as a part of their delivery time, uh, which, is, which is amazing. Um, we were also able to, um, to get out some, some innovation in, in, the, in this year as well. Uh, we created a chat bot um, that was able to reset our users' passwords now. Um, which was really a, a big win for us. We, we wanted to, to see, um, we, we took a look at all the reports, calls coming into our help desk, and we said, hey, how can we help these guys? Um, and it was really um, the largest volume of calls that they were getting were password resets. So we helped them um, put an innovative solution um, on our Cisco Jabber chat so that we can now reset users' passwords and they don't have to wait on a phone call all the time to reset passwords now, which, is, which was a big win for us too. Really got us out there uh, in the community. Um, but what does what does that what happens right? So as we're advancing, as we're using all these new technologies, um, and, and we we still have to deal with uh, everything else within the organization. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, complacency or a lot of hey I I still I, this is this is my thing this is what I want to do this is this is how I've operated for the number of years. How how do we how do we bridge those those two together? Um, so so there, there, there's some built up animosity there. Um, now, animosity isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, there is some good healthy animosity um, that, that helps spark um, different ways of thinking and, and how we operate. Um, but, but how do we kind of bridge that gap, right? So one of the things that, that we were able to do is bring in some resource expertise. Um, some of it was through acquisition. So this year we announced that we acquired um, a financial wellness um, startup called Hello Wallet. They're based in DC. Um, the, that acquisition actually allows us to um, bring in more products for our customers. It also brought in a, a wealth of talent now as well that um, continues to operate in an agile practice. They follow the methodologies um, and, and they've been one of our biggest supporters recently. Over the last three years, we've also been able to, uh, we've also seen an uptick in our um, development hirings. So uh, this is actually a graph here of over the last three years um, in our digital banking space, the number of developers um, over the last three years. So there's really a, a growth there and they're starting to get more and more um, talented uh, resources in those, in those places, um, really getting the skill set up to upskill everybody else that, that is already there, which is great. It's a great learning experience for everybody. We've also gone into the community and there's a number of different uh, technical boot camps or programming boot camps in, in, in the Cleveland area. Um, and I know our, our, test, uh, our testing team has done a great job in um, getting a lot of talent to come in as a part of those programs. And I think at last count, they were up over uh, 20 different hires out of those technical boot camps over the last year. Uh, again, another great win for us. Um, so that, so, so how, do, how do we optimize for speed and, and how do we continue to grow uh, what we're trying to do? Uh, so the first thing is really cross-functional expertise, um, making more generals, generalists out of everybody. Um, so one of the things that we did as a part of our reorganization that happened earlier in the year is um, kind of collapsing the teams a little bit. Think, teams that had similar capabilities, um, put them all on the same team so that they can kind of cross-train each other and that it's a real good educational experience there. So um, things like our, our OS teams, 
put the Unix team and the Windows team together and, and cross-pollinate and see kind of the, the skills grow, um, putting all the database teams together. This is kind of our first step in what we think the evolution is going to be. Um, it, it's not going to be the end step, um, but it is one of, the, one of the ways that we're trying to get that cross-functional expertise across, across the, the organization. We also do an, a daily 8 a.m. Uh, post-mortem meeting um, that is, is uh, organized by our chief technology officer. Um, so, so we go in and we talk in, uh, transparently and, and we give the facts and how to make things better. Um, so if so a system does go down, everybody can learn, everybody can figure out how to do better, uh, do, do better the next time. It's a really educational experience there as well. And then collaboration and visibility has been a, a huge thing as well. So visualizing the work that's coming in, making sure that uh, at any given time we're not, we're not bottlenecking anywhere in the way that we're delivering, um, delivering the services that we're offering for our different teams. Um, and and we're, we started that with our, our three teams in, in the division that we're in, and now it's going to be expanding over the course of the next, uh, next year or so, so that other teams are gonna be kind of operating in, in that, that manner as well. This is, and then finally, across the bottom, this is my, my Conway's Law reference. So as, as, the, as the management team was going in to talk about and figure out what the new organization looked like uh, as a part of this reorg that I've been talking about, they really went in and they tried to understand how work flows through the system. Um, we call it plan development run. Um, it's kind of a riff on plan build run, but it's kind of its own thing. Um, so it was really, how do we want work to flow through the system as opposed to here's our organization and here's how the work does flow through. So there was really a lot of thought put into um, our reorganization and, and what, the, what the structure looks like in technology to make sure that the work is, is flowing through the system uh, as, as most efficiently as it, as it can. Um, so that, that, that's really where we're at today. Um, our journey is not over. Um, we're we're going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to to learn from others. I think the story from Nationwide has been great. Um, we follow uh, the Capital One. We follow the Targets, um, the Starbucks, um, and and we have conversations when we can with 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 those folks. Um, but I would say if you're at a large organization and you want help. There's a number of resources out there that are willing to assist and give you um, any information as, as we can. Um, all you have to do is ask. And then lastly, I think the only thing I would say is just do something, right? At the end of the day, um, you can get all the sign-off or all the, all the leadership buy-in that you want, but at the end of the day, you just gotta do something. Um, even if it's small, uh, start with a minimum viable product, get something out there so that um, people can riff on it or um, you can learn what works and what doesn't. So um, I thank everybody uh, and I'm, uh, there's a few minutes I think for questions. Yeah, great. Folks may remember we have a microphone for you to ask questions. Please do so. So I was really impressed by that graph you had of traffic and able to determine whether you were actually resilient across data centers. What did you generate that with? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question, and it's actually a funny story. Um, so it, it started off with a, an Excel spreadsheet, uh, just a to, to and a from. Um, and then we put uh, the actual graphic was Visio. Each one of those Visio um, pieces has an ID. Um, and the, 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 the guy that I spoke with here last year, John Rez, who's, who's uh, my leader, um, actually put together a small little program that would just connect the dots. So how did you populate that spreadsheet? <laughs> so populating the spreadsheet in the first place, um, we spent about a month and a half interviewing um, people across the organization um, in order to come up with what the different components were, and then we just used stencils and put them on. That and was generated by doing an audit and yeah, so it, the question was it, was, it was generated doing an audit, not necessarily something watching it, yeah. Hi. Um, you talked about chatbot uh, uh, for, to reset password. How did you handle the security? How did you stop someone 
random uh, trying to uh, tell the or fool the chatbot saying, hey, reset the password for J. Smith or D. Smith. Yeah, so the, the chatbot um, will only reset certain passwords um, for a user, and we actually, it's all internal. The, the authentication and the, um, all, all of that is, we assume that the person that is chatting the bot is really who they say they are. Um, Chris, can you share some details about uh, how did you develop the 7,000 automated test cases? Who did it, how you did it, and how long it took? Can you repeat the first part of the, the question? 7,000 automated test cases you talked about in your presentation. The, the automation around, I'm, I'm sorry. 7,000. You, you mentioned you guys developed 7,000 automated test oh, cases. Oh, okay, the, right. the, the, the 7,000 automated tests. Yeah, yeah, okay. who did it, how long it took, and uh, how did you do it? Yeah, so, so as a part of our group, when we first spun up, we had a number of different resources. One of the resources that we had was somebody that was really a, a subject matter expert in the, in the testing space. Um, so they partnered with the, the, del the delivery and development team in order to make sure that the tests were getting created appropriately. Um, as, a, as a part of that, so we currently use um, JUnit for unit tests, um, Selenium, and WebDriver in order to drive the end-to-end -end tests. So as a part of our Maven build process, um, it does the te Maven drives the tests uh, in order to do that. So it's, it's really Selenium uh, and JUnit. We're, we're really part of those 7,000 different tests uh, done in collaboration with our quality team and, and the development team. Uh, the question was, do we use anything for service level tests? Um, not really at this point. Um, we're starting to dive into what it means to profile an application. Um, so, you know, this, this method or this transaction needs to take this, this amount of time. We're just now starting to get into some of that detail. Um, so as a part of the reorganization, um, the monitoring and, and alerting team, that's one of the things that they're, they're focusing on is getting a bunch of data so that we can have those exact kinds of conversations. Excellent. Uh, thank you guys again, and, and thank you to the event staff. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a great, uh, great experience. Thanks so much, Chris.